ready to roll then. Well, thank Perfect. you very much, everybody. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Steve Goldfarb, and this is our earthquake preparedness during a pandemic. So uh, we've been doing earthquake preparedness presentations for quite some time, but we went ahead and we customized it for the things you need to think about during, during this situation when we're all at home. There's more uh, you know, home preparedness we should be looking at, the type of supplies we should have, the type of um, things you can do to secure items in your home so that you reduce injuries and damage. So we're going to talk about all that. I'll be going at a pretty quick pace here, but um, please don't hesitate to stop me to ask me questions. I'll pause from time to time to ask if there are questions. Um, even though there's the um, chat there, um, feel free to just chime right in. Um, and that way, if I don't, I don't have to read all the questions, but if anybody sees a question on there and I keep on going, stop me so I could, I could take a look at it. So with that in mind, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as I mentioned before, we'll talk about the earthquake hazards, what to do during an earthquake, after the earthquake, and what you could do to prepare at home. So in Southern California alone, we have over 300 active earthquake faults. And the big one, the one that is so famous that probably for years and years, if you've been living in Southern California for a long time, know it, we're supposed to have the big one eventually. That's the San Andreas Fault, that big red line on that slide there. And that's the one that would start near the Salton Sea, near Palm Springs and make its way up through LA County, Northern LA County, up through the desert. And it just keeps on going all the way up the state. Now that's the famous one. Um, movies have been made about it. Not the greatest movies in the world have been made about it, but they've made movies. Uh, and there's also so many other ones that are just literally probably right under your feet. And uh, just the other day when we had this um, 4.5 earthquake that was near El Monte, that was part of the fault line that um, caused the Whittier earthquake back in the late 80s. And so some of these earthquake faults stay dormant for a while and then they wake up. And uh, the Northridge earthquake is probably the last real big earthquake we've had here in the Los Angeles uh, area back in 1994. So we are always subject to earthquakes and you know, we have about 30 earthquakes a day. Um, you could go online to the, United, to the uh, USGS, United States Geological Survey and, and look at a map like this and you could see there's so many earthquakes but the majority we don't feel or maybe they're too far away. Um, so a lot of times people get complacent and don't think about preparedness because why? It's not affecting us so why, why should I do it? Um, but in reality, I think COVID, as well as the wildfires and all these other emergencies that have been going on, are good examples of why we should be prepared for a moment's notice of something happening. So the San Andreas Fault, the one that I mentioned, uh, some research has, been, has uh, taken place around this. Back in 2008, uh, the Great Shakeout was created. It's an earthquake campaign and training and drill that's done every year in October. Uh, this year, although we'll participate, it'll be more of an educational thing than a drill just because of COVID. But USC has always participated in a big way. Um, we were the first drill in the history. By the way, the shakeout now is, is international. Uh, wherever there's earthquakes, there's a shakeout drill. Um, but we did the first drill ever. In the first time they ever did shakeout, the, the drill was at 10 o'clock. We started ours at 8 o'clock, so we, get the, we take the credit for being the first one. But this earthquake can cause 1,600 fires, 1,800 fatalities, 53,000 injuries, uh, cause a lot of people to become homeless, damage buildings. And this is a 2008 number, which means that it's probably a lot higher now than it is, was back in 2008 of $213 billion to recover from a disaster of this size. Now, this is the big one, of course, but we also had back in July uh, of this of last year, the Ridgecrest earthquake. And this earthquake was a 7.1 magnitude. Now, this is where I would like to use the chat, or you could just say it verbally on, on here. But I'm just curious, uh, wherever you were, if you felt the Ridgecrest earthquake and you weren't in Ridgecrest, let's say you were in LA, what magnitude do you think it was here in the Los Angeles area? Go ahead and, and throw out your, uh, your responses to that. Three point one, no clue. Thanks for being honest. No, four point five, wasn't it? Four point five. Okay, so it's interesting because it's a little bit about earthquakes. If you look at this, this is called a shake map that you're looking at here. This is generated in five minutes after an earthquake, and it shows you by the color the severity of the shaking. 
in reality, based on the definition of magnitude, no matter where you are, it's a 7.1. The magnitude never changes. So in LA, it was a 7.1. However, what changes is the intensity of the shaking. And that has its own scale and its own set of numbers, which is why it may not have felt like a 7.1 to you if you're in Los Angeles. So you can see how the colors on this map kind of spread out. And as you get towards the blue and the green, it's, it's less intensity. Another way to uh, look at this is this intensity scale here. You can see that you know a magnitude uh, 3.0 through 3.9 is, is, is likely to cause uh, in, you know, less intensity, obviously. But we as people do not feel earthquakes until we get to an intensity level three. Okay, so that Ridgecrest earthquake that you felt, certainly the one we felt the other day, those were at least a, a intensity three or, or higher. Intensity two, your dog and cats might go crazy because they sense the waves uh, from the earthquakes, but they can hear it, but we can't hear it or we can't feel it. And then from a four and above, that's when you have more shaking. When you get to about five or six, that's where you have really significant damage. Even at a four, you start having damage. So back in the Ridgecrest earthquake, we felt it as a three down here in LA. It was uh, intensity five or six up in Ridgecrest. That's where the damage was. And um, that's another factor that you need to look at, right? Because just because you hear the magnitude doesn't mean it wasn't as bad where you were. Any questions so far? All right, so here's some famous earthquakes of the past. 1857, Fort Tejon, that's the actual San Andreas Fault. So that's the last time the San Andreas Fault woke up and caused a lot of havoc. Back then in Los Angeles, there wasn't much to destroy. There were no high rises, big buildings, big utility infrastructure to destroy. So it's been a long time. And on average, the San Andreas Fault, technically based on science, is supposed to rupture about every 150 years. Well, if you do the math, 1857 plus 150, we're well long overdue, okay? So then you fast forward here, we have the Northridge earthquake in 1994. Here's the Whittier Narrows, which was on the same fault that we just uh, uh, had. Uh, Napa had an earthquake in 2014 that caused considerable damage and of course, Ridgecrest. So concurrent pandemic plus earthquake equals a lot more stress, a lot more problems, obviously. Now, what's going to happen in the big earthquake is you're going to have our emergency operations that are already overtaxed, not just from the pandemic, but I'll even throw in civil unrest in there, right? Because that's overtaxing our emergency services as well. And then now we have less ability to respond to big incidents like an earthquake. We're all on Zoom right now. That could go away. That probably will go away. Why? Because your power is going to go out. You know, internet service is bad enough as it is on a day-to-day -day basis. Now you add on the fact that we have an earthquake and the infrastructure for AT&T, Spectrum, and all those companies are, uh, will have problems. Um, in addition to that, the power, gas, and your water all cross the San Andreas Fault. That's how it comes into Los Angeles. So it's going to have damage at the San Andreas Fault location out in the desert, plus along the way. So it's going to be a long time before we could get those utilities back up and running normally, which means our, our way of communicating right now is going to go down the tubes. Um, new life saving mission would push the system to its limits, right? So the hospitals are already, uh, you know, pushing their limits. And now we're going to add these traumatic injuries, people going in for injuries. And then our supply chain, how many of you had a hard time finding toilet paper in the early stages of the pandemic? Okay, toilet paper is just one example. Now add that, and even food, some food items were hard to find. In this case, food's gonna be very hard to find and clean drinking water that's bottled and all the essential things, medications and whatnot. Why? Because our supply chain system is gonna break. It's gonna break because the freeway systems, you know, if we have problems, the trucks can't deliver and the warehouses could become damaged and people can't come into work and there's an aftershock after aftershock causing more problems. So the point here is that these are the things that we know are gonna impact us even worse than if we didn't have a pandemic. So when you look at this, the best, and I'm gonna go through this in detail, but the idea is you could do something about a lot of these things, right? Like storing food ahead of time, 
having your supplies and, and your extra medications, um, having another way of communicating besides relying on the internet. Those are things we're going to talk about because you could overcome this if you plan ahead of time. So with that, let's go ahead and talk about it. What are some of the other impacts? I talked about communications being impacted. Did you know that cell towers in the state of California legally do not have to be bolted to their foundation? Crazy, huh? We're an earthquake country, yet there's no law that says to do it. Um, debris and hazard blocking roadways. Um, when debris from buildings and poles and glass and, and hillsides, if they are impacted, then that's gonna block our roadways to move around. Of course, we'll have building damage. Now in an earthquake, or let's say the hurricanes is a good example, uh, there are people that need shelter. And normally, Salvation Army, American Red Cross, they open up a shelter in a local school gymnasium or parks and rec. Everyone gets a cot, everyone's fed. But we're telling people you can't come together like that because there's a pandemic going on. So it's the complete opposite. So it's been challenging. Fortunately, the hurricanes have helped us learn some lessons from that. And so there are some kind of workarounds, but really you need to think about where would you go if you couldn't live in your house after the earthquake? You know, what friends and relatives can you go to? Um, what kind of equipment can you have? You know, camping supplies to, be, to pitch a tent in your backyard. Those are the types of things to think about. And then our anxiety is already heightened from everything going on. So now you add an earthquake and the uncertainty of aftershocks, it just the mental health uh, issues just really skyrocket from all of this. Now I know I'm painting kind of a, a grim picture here, but this is reality and you can get through this if you take the necessary actions uh, like Jerry has done with getting his water container together. Um, that, that type of preparation really is gonna help you in the long run. So let me pause there before I go on to see if there's any questions. All right, so here's the good news. Building codes in California are some of the best building codes in the United States because we know there's earthquakes. In 1933 in Long Beach, there was an earthquake and there was a schoolhouse made of unreinforced masonry, which is brick. So you have brick, cement, brick, cement, but nothing, no, no big, um, uh, things inside the, the um, brick to keep it together. So this schoolhouse collapsed and there were children that were killed in that earthquake. And as a result of that, building codes were improved. And ever since then, there's been reinforced masonry buildings built. And then over every time there's a major earthquake, the 1971 Silmar earthquake, the uh, 1989 uh, Loma Prieta earthquake, and then the Northridge earthquake in 94, the building codes were increased and, and enforced because they were able to look at the reaction of the buildings and the earthquakes. And all of you are likely, if you live in a single family home, for one two story single family home, it likely looks like the picture on the upper right of this slide, which is wood frame. Now, if that is the case, during an earthquake, your house probably creaks a lot. It moves back and forth pretty good and you hear creaking, the windows rattle. That's good because you want the house to have some give and it's meant to do that. So the odds of having a collapse in a single or two story uh, single family dwelling is pretty, pretty slim. Um, we're more concerned about the older buildings uh, for having collapse. So that's the good news uh, about living here in Southern California. Um, so what we do in an earthquake is we drop cover and hold on. Those are the three steps. And there's various different rumors out there of what you should do, but this is the industry standard because what it does is the moment the earthquake starts, the idea is that you stop what you're doing and you, and you get down to the ground on your hands and knees. Now I'll show you some other methods if you're not able to do that. But the idea is if you keep on walking or if you try to run, you know, where are you going anyway? You can't outrun the earthquake. If it's shaking in your house, it's shaking in your front yard too. So where are you going? So the idea is to go ahead and stop where you are, drop, get underneath something, start covering your head and neck, which is vulnerable. And then once you're under a desk or a table, hold on if you think it's gonna move, okay? So let's go through that in a little more detail. So here's the drop part, and you can see the pictures on the right side of this person that's underneath a, a desk, protecting his neck while holding on. That's the type of table that's gonna move. If you have this very old, gigantic dining room table that's just takes 20 people to pick up and move, chances are it's not gonna move in an earthquake and you're okay. 
But uh, if you're not near a desk or a table, an interior wall is your next bet. So you see the third picture down, they're next to a wall where on both sides of that wall, you're on the inside of the building. And those walls stand up better than the walls that go to the outside. Now, if you're in a movie theater, if we ever get back to movie theaters or a lecture hall kind of thing, getting down between the seats uh, and duck and cover. Don't, you don't try to get under the chair. You never will get under there. The idea is just to be between the seats so that the top of the chair breaks the fall of any debris that might be coming down. So what's the rationale behind this? The rationale is not because the building will collapse, it's from stuff. So right now you're all probably sitting in your living room, an office, a bedroom, somewhere in your house. If you take a look around left and right, up and down, chances are you have stuff that will move in that earthquake, right? Um, Jerry has a big giant bookshelf with glass, right? Now, if he's secured that to his wall really well, great. But if he hasn't, that could become a projectile that falls down and injures somebody. And if certainly you have a lot of damage. I'm, I'm picking on him because I can see it but you know what, where you are right now and what you have around you. And so the idea is you're taking cover in any way possible to avoid the stuff from hurting you. So if you're in a wheelchair or you're not mobile, you're not able to move, um, what you still wanna do is get yourself to an interior wall, lock the wheelchair, and then put your hands over your head and neck. And of course, you don't wanna choose an area right next to a big window or any giant pictures or knickknacks that could hurt you. And we'll talk about how to secure those so you don't get injured in the first place. I'll pause there and see if there's any questions. If you're in bed, like the one that we had a couple of weeks ago and it, you know, 11.30 at night, is it better just to stay in bed and put the pillow over your head? And yeah, I'm gonna go over, um, as a matter of fact, I'll go over now, but yeah, I'm gonna talk about some unusual areas. So in bed, you want to, first of all, you wanna make your bedroom, children and grandchildren's bedrooms, the safest rooms in the house. Because at two o'clock in the morning, you're waking up, you're going, oh, is that an earthquake? Your reaction time is gonna be slow, right? So you wanna make it safe. What I mean by that is, is that anything that could come and crash down and hurt you, let's secure it. Um, I'll show you some ways to secure your pictures on your walls. You, you know, there's no reason why you can't have it. There's just, there's several ways to hang a picture and there's certain ways that are gar guarantee it's gonna fly and hit you in the head. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. But you stay in bed and you put your pillow and your blanket over your head and you write it out. And if, as long as you made your room safe, there's no reason to get up. In the 1994 earthquake, there were 40,000 reported injuries from the Northridge earthquake and a good 75% of those injuries were cut feet uh, from people getting up, running around their house, stepping on stuff that had broken. And a lot of them were tripping over stuff, trying to get to their kids in their bedrooms. Well, guess what? Out of the 40,000 reported injuries, nobody under the age of 16 was injured. And so those kids that were in their bedroom were fine, either because they slept through it and had no clue, or they woke up and just stayed there, <laughs> you know? so. Uh, it was the parents that were, were getting, uh, having injuries. So the next thing here, of course, we talked about cover. That's the same thing. And then uh, hold on, we talked about as well. And uh, here's some of the ways to adapt. So if a person can get down, let's say you have a cane, or let's say you can get down, but you have a cane, uh, you want to get down first and then just scoot yourself under a desk or a table. If you're using a walker, then get yourself into a walker uh, and sit down next to an interior wall. So get yourself to an interior wall, then lock the wheels, sit down, take cover. And I already talked about the wheelchair. Any questions about that? Remember your goal is not to get hit by the stuff. So here's the bed, uh, come other, some other unusual areas. If you're in a car, the question is how do you even know that you're uh, um, having an earthquake? Uh, some people say it feels like you're hitting a pothole, but you're in LA, so that's like every street, right? So how do you, how do you know? You know, you see the lights moving back and forth, the trees waving back and forth, windows rattling. The best thing to do when you're in a car is to pull over and don't keep on going because you don't know what's gonna happen in front of you. In the Northridge earthquake, there was a guy on a motorcycle, a police officer coming from the Palmdale area, driving to the San Fernando Valley. He took the 14 freeway to the five freeway. He didn't know that that transition had collapsed. It was dark, didn't see it, went right off and he was killed as a result of that. So pull it aside, but do not pull under or over an overpass. In every single major earthquake we've had in the state of California, 
some portion of the freeway system collapsed every single time, every single time. So you don't want to be under or over an overpass. Um, and you certainly don't want to be right under power lines. But other than that, you pull over and, and wait it out. We talked about the lecture hall and theater supermarket. I'm going to ask this question of you. You're in the middle of the supermarket. You're pushing your cart. What do you do? Get out of the canned food aisle and yes, try to know. find something that, if it hits you, doesn't hurt. Toilet paper. We won't be in the toilet paper section, right? <laughs> the Charmin won't hurt us. Um, so yeah, so you want to, what you want to do is you're going to get hurt by this stuff, right? Because we don't secure and Velcro down stuff on the shelves there. So one way is to get to the end of the aisle display because usually that's more static and you could just take cover next to the end aisle display as opposed to being in the aisle. Another is, is you could get down on your knees besides a basket, supermarket basket, and let it shield the front of your body. And if you want to get down lower than the top of it, so anything coming down hits the top of the basket and not your head, that's another way. If you're in a Costco or a Sam's Club, have you ever looked up in one of those stores? What's up when you look up? Crates of things. There's, there's this pallets of stuff, the back stock, and that stuff coming down, not good. Once again, get to the end aisle um, display, take cover against it, almost as if it was a wall, protect your head and neck. Don't try to run outside because everyone else is going to and you're just going to trip and hurt yourself. After the earthquake, of course, then you leave. And before you leave, my advice if you're in Costco, although they haven't been doing it during COVID, but I would normally say grab as many of those free samples as you can so at least you have another meal before you <laughs> run out of the store. Um, there's a few questions here. Um, uh, how much are how much are California fires affecting earthquake resources? Um, basically, when it comes to the fires, after the first um, 48 hours, 72 hours, typically they bring in resources that are committed to the fires for the long haul, and then the local resources go back to their normal services. So that's what's been going on. Um, so while it does tax it and can make it a lot worse. Um, it, could, it could hurt the water supplies because if we have an earthquake and now the water they're using uh, are, are, is compromised, then that's a problem. Uh, why is a disaster the mechanism? Uh, why is disaster the mechanism for earthquake change? Should we have different and more robust earthquake practices today? Um, you know, there's always there's always um, things that are evolving with practices for earthquakes. And later in the presentation, I'm going to talk to you about the earthquake early warning system, which is a huge um, technological advancement for the earthquake practices. And so I'll talk about that. Um, what if you're in the bath or shower? Um, the best thing to do is turn the water off and, um, and try to get onto a dry area where you don't slip um, if you can. Um, but of course, you just have to hold on, right? Because it's very, the key is it's very slippery. The reality is most showers and stuff don't have, you really don't have much hazards there unless you have like a glass door. And the glass door technically shouldn't shatter unless something hits it um, or you have very significant movement of, of the home. So the idea is to try to get yourself, your feet dry so you don't become slippery. But bathrooms are probably one of the more safer locations in a home as opposed to a kitchen with cabinets full of stuff. And then uh, someone asked about the name of the interchange. I don't know the name, but I know it was named after the officer and I should know it because I drive by it pretty often. All right. After the shaking stops, check for injuries or, or, or damage because you want to make sure that you address any problems right away. It's in that first five or 10 minutes the problems occur with fires, gas leaks, mixing, electrical problems mixing together. This, if you're on campus, that's the phone number there, 740-4321. But since all of you are at home, uh, you have to remember that the 911 system is going to be super, super, super overwhelmed. And uh, to the point where you're probably not going to get any kind of help from the 911 system. The fire department typically goes into what's called earthquake mode. And what they do is they drive their, their, their communities to check for significant ha hazards and problems before they start responding to emergencies. So if your water heater falls over because you didn't secure it, um, or you have some kind of damage to your house, the chances are you're on your own and you're not going to get any help. And that's the assumption. That's why at USC, we have so many emergency teams. We have our own fire brigade. We have um, a, a campus emergency team of staff and faculty that 
perform search and rescue and first aid. So we have all these tools because we know the city is not coming. Um, what are you looking for when you go, when you check after an earthquake? Well, first of all, when you get up, do it slowly because your surroundings might have changed. Your living room might look a lot different after that earthquake, right? So look for the hazards that you're going to trip over, um, spills, things like that. Um, of course, if you have significant damage, fires, smoke, gas leaks of any kind, chemical spills, then those are reasons why you should evacuate. Um, but a lot of earthquakes like the one the other day, yeah, no really, no one, you know, if you had a few things fall off the shelves, that's probably about all that would have happened in that earthquake. But it's also a good idea that in addition to checking your home, that you also do a 360 walk around your house on the outside, because you might see something on the outside that you couldn't see on the inside. And that includes going to where the gas um, service is to smell for gas. Your stove, your, wa your dryer, your water heater are the three most common, but you may have others. So you want, um, especially if you have a, a swimming pool or a spa, those are locations as well. And gas doesn't have a smell, but they add a smell so you know there's a leak. And I'll show you how to shut your gas off in just a second. Any questions so far? I see a question about, is a door frame safest? It was 1985 and earlier. And here's why I say that. In the 1980s, it was a big deal to do, to do the um, doorway. But and, and when it got to about the 90s, it started getting away from that. And someone asked, you know, why was a door frame a good place in the first place? It was because when homes and buildings were made of adobe, it was the strongest part of the building. But we're not living in adobe homes. Maybe you do, but there's very few left. And so it's, it's not uh, a recommendation because it doesn't afford you any more safety than any other part of the house. And in a lot of our office buildings now, to your office, it's no nothing more than some aluminum and drywall. It's not even holding, you know, the wall to your office isn't even holding the building up. So it's not recommended anymore. Um, should homeowners have an automatic gas shut off? The answer is, is it depends. And here's why. I wish it was a clear answer. At USC, every building has a gas shut off. Why? Because we want it, we, we have plumbers that could go in and reset that all if they, if they trip. At home, if you shut off your gas, you can't put it on until the gas company comes out at which point you may be waiting three to six months after a big earthquake, waiting your turn in line to do that. You want to keep your gas on unless you smell gas. That's why it's better to maybe not put it on automatically. But if you don't feel comfortable turning it off, if you don't feel comfortable, um, if you, especially if you live alone, you're not sure, um, it, definitely uh, consider doing that. But I will tell you, sometimes it causes more problems. It is good because you have a, you know for sure the gas is off, but like I said, now you don't have it, you have it off for a long time. And they trip at about a 5.5 earthquake, meaning they go into that mode in, in the fives. Um, then there's, uh, during the Northridge earthquake, cells worked, the landlines were overwhelmed. Now, what, uh, that would not be in the case, the true landlines are almost non-existent. If, if we turn off the gas line after an earthquake, how do we safely really take, so like I said, you really don't put the gas back on. You could but it's highly, 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 highly not recommended because it's just too unsafe. But technically you could. Um, the valves though, you need a plumber. Um, for the Northridge, earth, I mean, for the earthquakes, for the um, for landlines, just so you know that cell phones are, have the data part and they have the voice part. And so your data part might be ro more reliable than voice because the cell towers might be overwhelmed or down but getting a text message out might be more reliable. So have a plan to text message family and friends to, to check on each other and update each other. Uh, should we invest in a battery pack? Um, well, if you're talking about your phone right now in my pocket, I have two of those chargers and big giant ones that will, that will, I get it in shot here, that will charge my phone four times each. Why? Because I'm in the emergency management business <laughs> and that's why I have it. And I highly recommend that because once your power goes out, you're not charging your cell phone anymore, right? You need a way to charge your phone. And so whether it's one of those little packs like I have, or whether it's a generator, um, generators are highly recommended um, that you could make sure your phone is, is uh, up and running. So let me go through some of these uh, preparedness measures that you could go through. You know, you can't control how the earthquake's gonna shake you, but you can control how it's gonna harm you by how well you prepare. So a family plan, have a, a evacuation plan. If you have the grandchildren staying over your house or you have kids in your house, 
I recommend that you talk about if there was an earthquake or a fire, if they're old enough, of course, to talk about it, and say to yourself, look, if we had to evacuate the house, these are the ways, show them the ways you get out. And if you have a second story house, how do you get out? There's more than just a front door. Maybe there's a back door or a side door. Show them how to unlock it. If you have the type of uh, bars on your window for security, how do you release them? And also, you know, tell them the tree next in the, in the front yard of the next door neighbor is where we'll meet in case we get, we split up for some reason in the middle of, a, of, a, of an emergency. Have an out-of-state phone contact. So if that cell phone does work, you may be able to call New York as opposed to across the street because those lines are down. So the uh, family member or friend that's in New York becomes the hub for all the family members to call or text and they track where everyone is and, and help cross communicate with one another. So out of state phone con number, contact number is super important. So water, by the way, the red is the stuff we added for a pandemic. We used to say two weeks, just like we used to say go in a doorway, um, but we don't anymore because we know that the water supply is gonna be contaminated and it will be. Here's why, the, the pipes, the galvanized old, old pipes in Los Angeles and many cities that have been underground for 50, 60 years have this crud on the inside that's built up on the inside of the pipe. When the earth starts shaking, that crud will start to loosen up and flow in the water to your house. You don't wanna drink that. You wanna filter it or you wanna drink fresh water. So it'll be contaminated unless you filter it, like using purification tablets, boiling it for 10 minutes. Um, for cleaning, you could uh, add a quarter cup of bleach to a gallon of water and stir it and then use it for cleaning purposes. But we're talking about two gallons per person per day. If you're a, uh, the average drinker may drink about one gallon per day, but that's drinking. What about first aid and sanitation? That's why we say two gallons. If you use water, I'm gonna show you some examples that are like in the normal bottle, arrowhead type bottles of water. These are perfectly fine if you have the storage capability, but this is only good for about six months to a year in heat. So if you have a hot garage or you're storing it in the back of a hot car in the summer, the plastic breaks down and, it, and it's not good for, the, for you to drink. So you wanna turn this over. If you have a lot of bottled water and you have, let's say a, a two week supply, Drink it, buy more, buy more, drink it. Let's keep on rotating it so you have fresh water all the time. You could get the bigger gallons of water, although they're kind of harder to move when you have to carry them. And then you could do the uh, Jerry plan here, which is the 55 gallon drum, where you fill it up with water and this little uh, tab in the top, you put in a little siphon, which they sell on, in uh, disaster stores and on Amazon. And this little siphon thing is like a pump and you pump the water out of this uh, container and you put it on the side of your house and, and you're good to go. So many ways to store water. So I'll pause there and see if there's any questions. All righty then, food. We have more of the foods you should normally eat. You know, you could buy disaster food. Um, disaster food are typically these blocks of food. They're kind of like wafers. They have about 1200 calories in it uh, per day, good for three days. And they'll keep you alive. But if you want to eat the consistency of chalk for, for several weeks, then uh, okay, but you probably don't, or you'll get sick of that after a while. So there's nothing wrong with you storing normal canned foods that you like, as long as you have the discipline to go in there and turn it over when it expires. So whenever you put a kit together, you wanna write down the expiration dates and put a reminder in your phone when you need to turn it over. I suggest every time we change the clocks, daylight savings is a good time to check your batteries and your smoke detectors and also check your food and your first aid supplies, which is what usually goes bad in batteries. But the foods um, should be foods that you like. So you can even put an energy bar in there, but they're only good for three months. So as long as you have the discipline to go in every three months, if you don't, like me, you just buy the five-year shelf life food and, and you leave it alone. The food thing on the side here in this picture is a 30-day supply of food. And when I saw it at Costco, it said that it was good for 25 years. So I did some research on the company and it turns out they'd only been in business for three years, which makes me beg the question, how do they know it's good for 25 years? So I didn't buy it. Um, but there's many different food items, disaster food items out there that are good for at least five years. Uh, and uh, you want to buy it from a place that does a lot of turnover because some places it's already been on the shelf for a year 
when you buy it. So one of the places you can buy this stuff, not only online, but a place called SOS Survival Products. They're USC's vendor. They're located in Van Nuys. And their website, and I'll give it to you again at the end, but it's SOSproducts.com. That's SOSproducts.com. And at the end, I'll give you a coupon code and you get a USC discount from there if you buy anything. All right, any questions about food? All right. Medications, do not take the last pill and assume you're just gonna go to the, the, to the pharmacy later today and buy it because that's gonna be the day we have an earthquake, right? So what you wanna do is have a minimum of two weeks supply if you can. Work with your doctor on the amounts just so that you can have this extra supply of those medications you can't live without. Why? Because the supply chain is gonna break down and the pharmacies aren't gonna be able to deliver what you need. And so you're gonna need those medications. Um, have extra PPE available. That's the new thing on the list, right? Um, you're all wearing PPE now when you go out. Well, guess what? The PPE is gonna dry up fast after an earthquake. So you're gonna need to have that extra around disinfecting supplies. Um, if you wear glasses, maybe having a spare pair of glasses. And if you wear contacts, also having a pair of glasses because um, it's gonna be a very dusty environment in an earthquake and your eyes are gonna get irritated and you're probably gonna have a hard time with contacts. Um, my suggestion is, is always have a copy of your eyeglass prescription in your earthquake kit so that if you had to go to lens crafters and they're open, and you, yours breaks in the earthquake, you have a, you can in an hour get a, you know, a new set, go to Walmart and buy a cheap pair just for your earthquake kit. Any questions about that? All right, supplies. This is the type of supplies you should have, not only in your main kit, but also in a grab and go kit that either you keep close by and can grab on the way out the door, or if you have a work office, um, putting it under your desk in your office, or even having a quick bag, uh, to go bag in your car, in the trunk. What type of things? You know, the flashlights, the obvious one, a transistor radio because of technology going down, the work gloves, um, gas shut off range, certainly first aid supplies, it's all there. I'll give you a resource at the end that you can go online and get a complete list. Um, an evacuation bag with a change of clothes. I know when I go to work, if I wear dress shoes, um, that's not gonna do, I'm not gonna do too well in dress shoes. So having a pair of sturdy shoes. Um, hygiene supplies. Here's a good one, a contact list. You depend on your phone right now, right? How many of you take the phone and if you have Siri or, or uh, one of the other phones, you say, Siri, you know, call John. And John, and Siri calls John, right? Well, now Siri is, is no longer around because power has gone on, your battery has died, you have no way to charge it. So what you do is you write down the phone numbers on the back of a business card, 10 of the most important numbers, and slip it in your wallet so when you borrow someone else's phone, you have the number. I don't know about you, but you know, 20 years ago, I memorized phone numbers. Today, I don't know any of them, um, right? Because I depend, depend on my phone with the directory. So if, if, that, if you're in the same situation as me, you might wanna write some of those important phone numbers down on the back of your business card. Uh, critical papers, putting them maybe in a fire uh, proof um, safe, it doesn't have to be an expensive safe. I could tell you that Target and Walmart sell document type of fireproof safes for about $50. It's worth it. Um, if you have critical papers, you might wanna even make copies and send it to a relative out of state and ask them to store it. And cash, and it's low denomination cash. Ones, fives, ones and fives. But let me ask you, why do I say low denomination and why cash when everyone uses credit cards today? But the credit card machines will be down and people might not be able to make change. Exactly. Or you're going to pay, you know, it, the, the credit card machines for sure are not going to be working because of, of power, the internet needs. Um, the fact is, even when you go to the gas station, you're going to, you can't even buy gas, right? Because it's all electronic. You're going to need cash to get stuff. And if you have a $20 bill and you go to the liquor store to buy a Diet Coke for two bucks, and that person, you know, a lot of people are going to take advantage of you and say, you know what, sorry, I don't have change. And now you just paid $20 for a $2 Diet Coke. So small bills is always better to have. Um, any questions about the supplies? We do have kits in our buildings at USC. I'll just mention real quickly, we have search and rescue gear. We have other disaster supplies, just so you're aware that we do have it on campus. 
So here's how you secure your furnishings. They sell nylon earthquake straps. Where is there? Well, there is every hardware, most hardware stores have an earthquake aisle. And on that earthquake aisle, they have, um, they have a display of these different products that um, by a company called Quakehold. And they sell it for different types of furniture. So if you have a four drawer um, dresser, then they sell it for that. If you, have, you need one for a water cooler, they sell it for that. So you buy the one for the particular furniture and you'll see here in the picture, it's a bolt that should go into the beam in your wall. So you have to make sure you don't just put it into drywall because it'll pull away. And then these, the other part goes on the furniture, but this is actually a sticky piece of tape with Velcro. Now, some people take a metal bracket and secure their furnishings to the wall, which works, but now you want to vacuum behind it once in a great while, and now what do you do, right? And you have to drill into your furniture because one part goes in the wall and one part goes in the furniture. This does not damage the furniture, and all you have to do is pull this very strong Velcro up, and guess what? You can move the furniture any way you like. So this is really good, and it's flexible enough to have some give so it doesn't hurt the wall or anything. It actually, you want it to move a little bit. So that's one way of securing furnishings. And you're securing it because you don't want it to fall over, hurt you, block you, hurt pets, hurt small babies. Um, and of course, you don't want it damaged in the first place. That's the number one injuries from earthquakes is stuff, right? I said that before. Well, this is securing the stuff you're not going to move every single day. Then we have these pictures. So right now, if you have a nail in the wall with a wire on your picture and the wire is hanging on that nail and you know who you are, that is gonna come off your wall and go right across your, your hallway. Now, if you don't want that to happen, then you buy one of these things, which they come in a pack of six for about $5. You put that nail through there into the wall and then the wire gets trapped inside of this little hook. That way it doesn't go flying off the wall. This will save you a lot of hassle after the earthquake. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good investment. Those are picture hooks. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it at a hardware store. You can get it at SOS. When it comes to shelves, you might secure your shelf to the wall, but what about the stuff on the shelves? Those become projectiles in an earthquake. So there are things like bungee cords that are made for shelves. Um, in our labs at USC, we put netting so things don't fall off shelves. In libraries, they have these metal bars that come down. Um, there's also these special straps with these um, thumb um, hooks that go in there. Just think about, you know, anything that's over waist height should be secured in some way. If it's below your waist and it falls off, it won't be as bad as something hitting you in the head from a higher height. And then there, of course, there are knickknacks. And so they sell this uh, museum putty, which is this stick of putty. You take a little dab, the size of a dime. You clean the surface or whatever it is you want to tack down. You put it on the bottom. Let's say it's a vase. You put it on the surface that you've just cleaned, and it's not going to go anywhere. One pack will probably take care of your house and your neighbor's house. It goes a long way if you don't overdo it. So that's another thing is the Quake Cold Museum Putty. And then there's cabinets. So any cabinet over waist height in your kitchen or garage is a good idea to secure it. There's five different examples here, but mostly a lot of these are used for child proofing. Um, you have the hook type, you have the type that has a little knob that you turn. Um, there's a type where you just, it kind of snaps in when you close the cabinet. You really want to do those to those upper cabinets. Um, if I'm not mistaken, and I don't know who it was, maybe that person's on here, maybe not, but I remember a faculty member from the School of Gerontology telling us years ago that they were in the middle of the Northridge earthquake and one of their drawers in their kitchen opened and knives flew out during the Northridge earthquake because they were near the epicenter. I don't know if anyone heard that story before, but it was in the School of Gerontology um, where that person resides. So that's some of the ways to secure your cabinets. Appliances, you want to have flexible hoses going to the gas lines. Technically, legally, you can't sell a house without it. But if you've been living in your house for years and haven't sold it for 20, 30 years, you may have older types of connections. So you want to make sure you have those flexible connections. Your water heater should be strapped with what's called plumber's tape, which is just straps it to the wall so it doesn't fall over. Um, you can do the same thing with your stove because those are where the gas is going to rupture. So 
utilities, I've already mentioned to you that they're going to become comp compromised and probably for a long time. But if you have a gas leak and you smell it and you need to shut off the gas, this is a picture of your gas meter outside of your home. And there's a pipe. And on that pipe is a valve. Okay. And here's a close up of the valve where my cursor is. And it's in line with the pipe. So what you do is you get yourself a wrench and you turn it so that it goes across the pipe, okay? You want it to cross the pipe. So it's a half turn and it crosses the pipe. Your gas will shut off. You don't turn it back on until the gas company or plumber verifies that your leaks are dealt with. Um, and then so what you wanna do is every year, call the gas company, ask them to do a safety check of your uh, valves. You're paying for it already, by the way. You pay for it every month. You pay a certain percentage for maintenance on your gas line. So why not have them come out for free? And what you want to do is one, do a safety check. Two, ask them to exercise this valve, meaning they actually turn it while they're there. Why? Because sometime with certain type of weather or heat, it'll actually freeze up. And when you go to turn it in a real situation, it's not going to turn for you. So have them make sure it works fine and it doesn't cost you a dime because you're already paying for it anyway. So that's the gas. I'll pause there and see if there's any questions. We're all good or am I overwhelming you? <laughs> so much information. Okay, electrical. This panel should look familiar. It's either behind a door in your house or on the side of your house. Uh, apartments will probably have it inside. And so there are uh, breakers and there's multiple small breakers. There's actually um, uh, two rows of them and one big breaker at the top. If you have an electrical problem, especially if you have a gas problem, you want to turn the power off. Here's the rule of thumb. Turn each small breaker off first, one at a time. So you basically, if it's on the left, you pull it to the right. That yellow tab, just pull it to the right until it clicks. One at a time and when you go through all of them, then you turn the big one off. If you do the opposite and do the big one first, you could get a spark, which is completely opposite of what you were trying to accomplish in the first place, okay? Now, can you put power back on? Yes, you can. One, you need to make sure you have no gas leaks before you do it. Two, you have to make sure the electrical problems that you saw at the beginning are no longer happening. And three, you do the opposite of what you did before. Turn the big breaker on first, then you do each individual small one as you turn them on. Any questions about your power and electrical? Okay. All right, I know we have five minutes. So are your water, every water device in your house has a shutoff valve. You have a shutoff valve outside your house, you've become familiar with what it is, but you also have a valve outside at the curb under a big plastic or cement little cover. And if you dig through the mud, you'll see a valve. And this valve has a pipe, also has a, um, the, the turning device, the valve here is in line with the pipe. And if you have a break between the street and your house, you would turn this to cross the uh, pipe and turn the water off from the street to the house, only the street to the house. And you need a water shutoff wrench for this. So it's a good idea to buy a combo gas shutoff valve and water shutoff valve for about $15 that you could pick up. And then um, let me just skip to one other thing here and then we'll, we'll end it for time here. I wanna mention the earthquake early warning system. There is now an app you could get on your phone um, to get earthquake early warnings. The closer you are to the epicenter, the very little or no warning you'll get, okay? The farther you're away, the more of a warning. So if the San Andreas fault goes, you might get as much as a 30 second warning as long as you're not in Palm Springs at the time. So with this, you, it's called MyShake. Um, there's a couple, there's also MyShake LA. They all work off the same system, the same way. Um, a lot of people said that it worked really well for the earthquake that just occurred. Uh, that's all really subjective based on where you live because at USC, they were so close to the epicenter, they didn't get any warning. But if you were in, you know, Ventura <laughs> or you were in San Bernardino somewhere, you might've gotten 15, 20 seconds of warning. And if you get a warning, there's a lot you can do, like pull over to the side of the road, um, get out of that shower that you were in, um, you know, stop cooking. A surgeon could stop doing their surgery. Um, firefighters could get out of the fire station. There's a lot we can do. We could slow trains down. At Disneyland, we could stop the rides. 
There's a lot that we can do with earthquake early warning and you can download that for free from the app stores. Any questions about the earthquake early warning system? So um, let's see, is it, is it just, uh, just that's, uh, it's on there and it's just that webs, what kind of a website and do you yeah. have to sign up or anything? It's just an app. No, you okay. go to the app store and you oh, download. Oh, it's the app. Yeah, okay. and uh, you could download uh, My Shake. Oh, okay. All and right. The it's other the one is Shake Alert LA. Okay. Although the boundaries on that one is supposed to be LA County only, so whereas okay. the other one I think is a little more farther boundaries, and oh. then there's um, they're supposed to be coming out with some soon where you could set the boundaries and you could set the yeah. settings on it. You okay. won't get an alert unless it's going to be an intensity three or higher, meaning an intensity oh, okay. three or higher. Sure. Makes okay. sense. Thank you. Okay. I do want to mention one more thing and then I'll take some questions until we have to go, which is um, right in front of you on the screen is the SOS survival products information. And there's a code there. You could snap a picture with your phone right now. Um, that is the, uh, they sell those one person, four person kits. They have pet kits they have sanitation kits they got you can make your own kit or one that's all laid together already um so many items they have there you can go on their website you know usc you get a 10 percent discount so that's there for you so questions i could probably have time for one or two questions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um let's see about the the shut off uh, wrench there so uh, just a huge big pipe wrench wouldn't wouldn't do it for the uh uh turning off the water and the gas you i mean can, i have one you uh, could you could use a regular crescent wrench uh, oh, but yeah. these all yeah. wrenches that are already sized and just made just for that and it per fits perfectly over that valve and it's long enough to give you the um the, the kind of the ability to push down on it if it's tough um to, to move yeah. Um, and they're not that expensive. Uh, but yeah, you could just use a regular wrench as well. But I could tell you the one, the water one is a lot more tough because it's in the ground. So you yeah. need the water okay. wrench. Okay. Yeah. All right. So just get a big one. Yeah. Spread by okay. the combo and be done with it, right? And have it ready. I to know. Go. There you go. Wouldn't, wouldn't we be alerted to a problem with the water supply if we were, you know, if we had to turn the water off at the street? No, we're only t I'm, we tell you this because if you have a water break between the street and your house, no one's coming to fix it right then and there, and you're going to have a flood. So you're going to want to shut it off so that your front yard doesn't flood. Because mm -hmm. it's the pipe between the street and your house. So if you have a front yard, your, flood, your street is going to be flooded big time by the time anyone gets out there to shut it off for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Let's see. Uh, could you tell me again about being in Costco? I didn't quite get the ceiling stuff. Yeah, because there's a lot of stuff that they store above your head. So you want to get to the end aisle display because there's always a display at the end of the aisles for something and hunker down and protect your head and neck right next to the display. Because if you're in the middle of the aisle, that stuff could come down. So that's the same as the, the grocery store then? Yeah, it's very similar to grocery store. Yeah, but Costco is even worse because they have a lot of stuff above your head and a lot of yeah. hazardous materials. I know we're out of time, so I'm going to end here now. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, the biggest part of this whole thing is it's, it's, it's worth the hour for you to, sit, to, to watch this, and it's worth the hour for me to share it if you take action to prepare yourself moving forward. So even this weekend, think about putting shoes by your bed or check your batteries and your flashlight. Look at your supplies. Um, think about how you might strap some furnishings. If you do that this weekend, it'll make it all worthwhile what we just did this past hour. So thank you uh, to everyone on here for having me. And I hope you found it valuable. Thank you so much. And thank you so much. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Um, and I know I myself, I'm, I'm going to get some of these things for my children's households. Not you just great my... Christmas gifts. Kids make good gifts, Christmas gifts. For sure. For sure. So. Again, thank you so much. I'm sure you're protecting a lot of people by doing this, and we, we, we're very grateful to you, and, and uh, we will post this on our, on our website very soon. Great. Well, thank you so much. Take thank care, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, Don, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Yeah.